Have you been enjoying our Impact Podcast and our great guests? Then please give us a thumbs up and leave a five-star review on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your favorite podcasts. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity focused hardware destruction company in the United States and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm, I'm John Shigeri, and I'm so excited to have with us today, John Mennell. He's a strategy leader and managing director of sustainability, climate, and equity at Deloitte Consulting. Welcome to the Impact Podcast, John. Thanks for having me, John. Um, you know, before we get talking about all the great work that you and your colleagues are doing in sustainability, climate, and equity at Deloitte, can you first share a little bit about your upbringing, where you grew up, and how you even got on this, this uh, fascinating journey? Sure. I, and I'll, I'll try to keep it uh, reasonably short, but um, I grew up in uh, Dallas. My father was a doctor and my mother was a teacher, so no real business background at all. And um, I had went to university and uh, with a degree in history and linguistics, and I fully intended to be uh, become an academic and get, pursue a PhD. And um, really by chance, I met uh, the head of uh, Deloitte's Russia practice right when I was out of uh, out of uh, undergrad, and I was in Russia, and he introduced me to the idea of consulting, which I had never heard of, and Deloitte that I had never heard of, and and. It's kind of all history from there. So I joined Deloitte right out of college. Wow. Uh, I got an MBA uh, about five years after. I decided I wanted to spend some time in industry. So I spent time in um, in high tech and in venture capital and then uh, came back to Deloitte about, um, uh, about 13, 14 years ago. Great. Wonderful. And, uh, um, and so I have to ask this question because... Are you also a long-suffering Cowboys fan, given that you grew up in the in the I, I am I am a long-suffering Cowboys fan. I, I grew up in the Starbuck era and still still pretend great, that's where we are. Great, great to meet you because so am I. Yeah. <laughs> um so you know, I'm 60 years old, John. And so Deloitte, to me, even though we had your wonderful colleague Evan Harvey on talking mm. about a lot of these issues uh a, a little while back, Deloitte to me. Before I ever started talking to Deloitte about sustainability and having you on the Impact Podcast, always meant accounting. But you have a very vibrant and large and growing sustainability practice. Can you share a little bit about the, um, you know, the genesis of that practice and 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 the journey and how big has it really grown? Yeah. So um, it's a great question, and we're, as you know, we're. Uh, a really large firm. We're the largest professional services firms. So we're over sure. 400,000 people worldwide, which, um, you know, our growth over the past decade has been amazing. So even when I say that, I, I kind of catch myself, but that's how big we are now. Right. And um, we've actually been doing sustainability and ESG work for a long time. And so we had to go back and check. And our the, the first sustainability practice we had that I, I found was actually back in the 90s. So we've been we've been kind of at this work for, for a long time. Wow. What's what's changed, though, is um, about three, four years ago, we made a decision to um, to create a unified practice. So before that, we had, I would say, a lot of little pockets of people doing different kinds of sustainability and ESG work. Um, and we did a strategy that basically said that there was, um, uh, which I led for a CEO at the time, which 
which said that there's a there's a big opportunity in sustainability in ESG. We have a lot of uh, capabilities across our practice, but we were sub optimizing them because they were they were all in little parts. Mm. And so we pulled together a single global practice. Mm. Um, we have over 10,000 practitioners in that practice. Now, you may have seen the announcement that we're investing a billion dollars in building that practice. Um, mm. And it combines um, all of our businesses. So our accounting business, our consulting business, our financial advisory business that does a lot of work on uh, M&A, for example, and valuation of solar transactions and things like that. And very importantly, our tax business, um, all into one single single practice. And if you think about the strength of that, is um, not only can we do the, you know, the strategy and the operations and the supply chain work that comes out of our consulting practice, uh, we can help all the companies with all the accounting and reporting and disclosures. Uh, we can help companies actually do transactions to to do large power purchase agreements. Um, and the reason I mentioned tax particularly is, um, especially since the since the IRA, we find that the tax benefits, other credits, incentives, both in the U.S., globally, at the state and local level, um, often make a real difference. And they and they pay for a lot of the the decarbonization journey, or at least make it much more financially attractive. And so we think we're one of the the few firms that can kind of bring all of that expertise together. So an integrated services firm with regards to sustainability. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and just for our listeners and viewers to, that want to find John and his colleagues and all the great work they're doing in sustainability, climate and equity, please go to www.deloitte.com. Once you're on that site, you can hit the services button right up in the upper toolbar on the left hand side. I'm on it now. And then when you hit services, you just drop down and you hit and you see sustainability, climate and equity. And there's a lot of information there. We're going to put that in the show notes. So no need to worry about finding it. It will be in the show notes. Uh, and uh, John, now let's talk about you're you're you've been doing this quite a long time now. Yeah. So you're really, a, for lack of better terms, a sustainability OG. Things have happened, though, in recent years to really sort of indicate that the fits and starts that you, we we saw back in 05, 06, and 07 with regards to um, the excitement that was around Inconvenient Truth and what came out of that. But then we went into the 2008 sort of financial crisis, and that sort of put a, a little bit of a cloud over uh, the sustainability revolution here in North America. It seems as though ESG and the shift from linear to circular economy and yeah. the sustainability revolution is now an undeniable and unstoppable trend, not only here in North America, but around the world. So how does that inform your Fortune 100, 200, 500, and 1,000 clients, which you consult to, obviously, historically, as to getting with the program and starting to leverage your practice in climate change and also their, their racing goals to net zero? Yeah, so it's a great point, and I, I think you're absolutely right that um, – uh, the kind of the net zero journey and decarbonization has really taken off in the business community. And, um, and for a cu couple of reasons, and maybe it's like two or three reasons. The first is that the reality of climate change has, uh, has just become much more evident to, to people. And uh, we can talk about the science, the scientific evidence is, is really important. Uh, we're also all seeing it in, in the weather. Right. And, um, you know, Deloitte does an annual uh, CXO survey. And one of the questions that we asked last year was what percentage of respondents had personally uh, experienced the effects of climate change? And 82 percent of the respondents in that survey said that they had personally experienced the effect of climate change. And that really resonates with, you know, what I'm hearing from uh, my clients and also people, you know, in my personal life that I think it's just, it's just much more reality. People, people feel it much more viscerally and that, that makes them want to take action. Um, the, the other part of it is that, um, the economics have changed. So in most cases, uh, decarbonization is good for businesses. It makes, makes or saves money. And, um, you know, I say a lot that, um, you know, carbon um, is cost, you know, carbon is waste is cost, right? So when you're taking carbon out, you're usually taking cost out of the system. And just to give you some data points, you know, um, the cost of renewable energy has been coming down 20% a year for over a decade. And so it's now the, the cheapest power source. We're seeing similar cost curves with, with uh, electric vehicles. 
And so a lot of times the, the choices that companies have to make when they decarbonize is, is just good for their business. And when I started doing this work over a decade ago, we would do the economic analysis for a company and it, you know, none of it really made money directly. There were reasons to do it for your investors or brand for product differentiation, but there was not a clear dollar and cents business case. And now when we put together all those, in, you know, the projects that a large company will have to do to reach net zero, about 70% of that footprint actually saves them money. And so you can go to a, you know, a skeptical uh, a CFO, and there's usually someone in the C-suite who's skeptical, and just walk through the numbers and, and uh, you know, it pencils out very well, and it's usually a pretty clear business decision. And just give me a rough overview. You know, I'm not expecting any forensic, uh, you know, perfect numbers or so. But how many offices and or continents does Deloitte cover around the world? So uh, uh, we're in a hu- 150 countries. So pretty, I mean, pretty much everywhere. 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 Right? Yeah. And, and how many employees or so do you have, roughly? Roughly speaking, over 400,000. Over 400,000. And yeah. and clients, some massive number of clients. Yeah, ninety percent of the Fortune 500. Right. Yeah. So I'm coming to you, and I'm let's just I just like bookend this. So I'm the CEO of either a Fortune 100 company or Fortune 1000, or by the way, uh, a company that's not even in either. I'm just a privately held company that's growing fast, and I want to get on the right side of sustainability, climate, and equity issues. So I come to you to be my one-stop shop of integrated services in terms of the trusted advisor to help me on that journey. That's right. Yeah. And and when we're usually working with companies, um, we're first helping them decide uh, what are the issues that matter to them. And so the science is clear and climate change is, you know, is an important priority for virtually every company. And uh, when we talk to you know, when I talk to a CEO, their other C-suite executive, they're they're already hearing. Uh, if they're not far down the journey, they're hearing about the importance from their customers and their investors. Um, but for but there are also other issues to think about. Um, equity is in the name of our practice. Equity is an important part of this because um, you know solving climate is not an engineering problem. There are humans involved, and if it's not fair, it just won't work. And so we're also asking companies to really think about. Uh, their employees, the communities they work, you know, they work in all of their stakeholders and, you know, and how they should be implementing these kind of goals. And and so that's the first part. And then the second is really helping companies put together uh, a plan for decarbonization and their other ESG goals, and then really working um, the economics of that plan so that it's, um, so that it's, you know, accretive for their business. And um, most of these plans are really about, um, you know, making the company better over the long term, so making it better, more valuable, more more resilient business, and and then the third part we work on is uh, is the implementation. So how do you how do you get there, right? And so um, which involves um, uh, you know efficiency in buildings, it involves electrification, it involves electrifying the fleet, you know, all of the things that that you know about and work on. Um, and and there's just a, a lot of uh, blocking and tackling to get you know to get all of that done. So instead of me hiring uh, thirty or twenty or fifteen executives to manage all these different services we need to get to our goals and to create actually a footprint and a, and a blueprint to uh, and a roadmap ahead of us, I bring you on. You already have subject matter experts in all these areas and disciplines, and you're able to set out a path forward uh, and then create. Goals that uh, you know are scalable and reachable over the next uh, years ahead, and then report on that to me, so I can then could package that report, put it into my ESG or impact report for my C-suite, my board of directors, analysts, my constituents and clients. Is that sort of the the the, I, the value proposition? I think that's right. I mean, I think we always advise companies to build sustainability experience internally, both in their exec team and on their board. Um, where, where we can help is where um, we have experts in all the disciplines you need. We're seeing the same issues across many different companies. So I think we can just bring bring a perspective that's, um, you know, that's helpful and, and additive in, as companies get on the journey. Well, well I'm going to ask my next question is about technology and yeah. the other huge trends beside the shift from the linear to circular economy and the, and the, 
and ESG and the, and the need to not only talk the talk, but walk the walk is a rise of AI and uh, self-learning technologies that are out there uh, with regards to automation, robotics, and others. How does technology factor into your practice? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and it's interesting. I talked about the fact that um, I led the strategy team that set up our sustainability practice about four years ago. When we finished that strategy, our, our CEO asked me what role I wanted to have. And I said, I wanted to, I want to focus on technology and alliances with technology companies. And the reason was that I you know, had been doing this for over a decade. And in a lot of really sophisticated companies, sustainability is amazingly low tech, right? It's still uh, in small groups. It's in Excel. It's uh, uh, you know, in fairly simple tools. And it was just really clear to me that that was going to change. Um, so, you know, over 70% of the Fortune 500 has a net zero goal. When you talk to those executives and we, you know, it's in my conversations and in surveys, almost all of them cite data availability and quality is a real obstacle in getting to those goals. So it's, so it's a real challenge. And so what we've done is um, we work with our uh, major alliance partners, and those are you know the largest technology companies in the world, Amazon, Alphabet, SAP, Salesforce, that we have deep practices with, and we're working on them specifically on what's the strategy for sustainability, how can their technologies really uh, move the needle. And then we're also working on our um, own accelerators and managed services. And just to give you a couple examples, uh, we've released... Um, a uh, product called Greenlight. That's a decarbonization strategy product project. So it helps companies understand their footprint, put the strategy together, reduce the footprint. And what's really important is then it helps them optimize that over time. So a large company may have a thousand projects, abatement projects. There's a capital expense figure attached to that. Technologies are changing so fast. They need to be relooking at that with the help of AI all the time to reduce the amount that they're spending, to increase the returns, to resequence things. And that's what uh, you know, Greenlight helps them do. Um, we've also re released another product called Greenspace that is a climate hard tech navigator. So it helps companies understand what are the hard technologies that are coming down the path, how mature are they, uh, and where should they be investing or doing pilots now? So for example, if they need, um, to do uh, electrification or hydrogen fuel cells for uh, for long haul trucking, for example, what's the what's the maturity of that technology, and when when will that be ready? And you know, who are the leading startups in that space now? And that's what that that you know that product helps companies look at. If you've just joined us, we've got John Menel with us. He's a strategy leader and managing director of sustainability, climate, and equity at Deloitte. To find John and his colleagues and all their work they're doing in sustainability, climate, and equity, please go to www.deloitte.com. Hit the services button and drop down, and they have a whole practice right below that. It's sustainability, climate, and equity. You could, cl you could uh, click on there, and it will be in the show notes as well. Let's go back to technology, green light solution. Uh, so... Greenlight solution, it becomes, I would assume, a dashboard that becomes unbelievably powerful because of the density of you covering tens of thousands of clients in, in 150 or right. so countries around the world. That's your real, how do I say this the right way, strategic advantage over if I have a company and I want to learn how to get on this sustainability journey, net zero journey, and I go down to a regional um, consulting firm, Jones Consulting, and they're going to put together a program for me, they really can't compete with your kind of density of information, which then I assume uh, green light solution cross checks and cross pollinates all the information Sorry. among all the countries and all the clients you have. So you truly have what's working and where and why, and you're able to plug that into my unique solutions and skill sets and also where I am in the journey to give me the most efficient solution that's possible. Is that sort of the, that, the that's no, you have it exactly right. So Green Space okay. Solution has uh, an abatement projects library, which our teams from all over the world contribute to. There are over wow. 600 projects there. And so, uh, you know, there are teams in um, uh, in Europe and Asia Pac and Africa, the Middle East and North America, who as they do work and they produce economic models on anything from renewable energy to manufacturing processes to building efficiency to you know uh, fleet electrification 
uh, they're contributing those models, and then that goes into the, the the plans that are developed for each new new client. And that that scale um, is 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 really something important to get uh, you know to, to 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 get a real global view of what's possible. It's a real time ongoing data bank that's that's constantly growing that I can leverage if I'm a client of of your of your practice. That's exactly right. So I'm the CEO of, for for fun's sake, Hilton. And I tell my chief sustainability officer, hey, come on in my office and show me what we're really doing. And so she comes in and she pulls up on my big screen green light solutions that she's brought on from, from Deloitte. So we can look at all of our portfolios of real estate and properties and managed properties right. across the planet. And we can sort of get a great snapshot of where things are real time. That's right. A, a single view of your entire plan and the economics associated with that plan is is exactly what it's what it does. So the rise and the convergence of both of these major trends of sustainability, a shift to linear circular economy, the need to on an ESG basis talk a good talk but walk a good walk for leaders around the world, integrated or at least converging and cross crossing with this rise and need for technology, AI, automation and self-learning technologies. Talk about where we are. Which one is ahead of the other? Which one has to catch up a little bit more? And how are they going? How do you foresee them evolving together and even becoming more integrated and necessary to support one another in the months and years ahead? And and when you say maturing together, you mean AI and yeah. the other technologies in space? Yeah, or? like AI that becomes then, you know, we don't know. Uh, where it's going to truly end up and how amazing and incredible it could do be. But you have a lot greater visibility to the latest and greatest gadgets and tools and software yeah. that exists out there. Where do you think we are? I know there's no perfect crystal ball on any of this, but where do you think we are? Is the need for this stuff uh, faster than they can produce it and keep up with the, the different forensic and specific needs, or is yep. it is it is is it is it is it pretty much going down a concurrent path of of where you're going on transactional reportable uh, uh, um, yeah. facts? I, yeah, and data. Good question. I mean, we're we're just starting. I'm I'm personally really excited about where things are are going to go yeah. with AI. Yeah. Um, there's definitely need now, but um, the state of technology is improving really rapidly. Yeah. So let me give you two examples of sure. uh, how how AI is affecting sustainability. There's one set of examples in the physical world that um, AI is just going to improve the effectiveness of physical technologies. Okay. And to give you an example, we're talking to a company that's uh, AI and quantum computing company. They're working on uh, hydrogen electrolysis, so on hy hydrogen hub technology. They believe that the use of AI is just going to improve the efficiency of those electrolyzers 30 to 80% over the next couple of years. Which, as you imagine, that means you know cutting the cost of that hydrogen down by that amount, which starts making it very competitive for applications like green steel, right? And that's and that's purely through using AI to um, to to redesign the process and redesign the technologies that are they're creating the hydrogen. So, in the, and in the physical world, there there are a lot of uh, of those kinds of applications. In the digital world, there are similar applications. So what you know, green space uh, tech is doing, which I mentioned, the Climate Hard Tech Navigator, is that's using AI to be able to go out, cull knowledge from over 80 uh, R&D centers, venture firms, incubators that we have, and match the right uh, innovators with the right technology needs for, for the large companies we have. And so that's so so both kind of what happens in the physical world, it happens in the digital world with matching technology. I mean, AI is going to is already starting to have a huge effect on what's possible for us to do in, in sustainability. And that's also part of your great value proposition because of your size and where you sit and where your platform sits, you have access to technology that we haven't even heard about yet on Bloomberg and CNBC. You have access to technology that's just up and coming. I, I would at least say that we have the scale and relationship so that you know what's going on in the the biggest technology companies in the world, the universities, venture yeah. firms, startup communities, we're we're in all of those uh all of those dialogues. Talk about also, we've talked about green light solution, green space uh tech, uh your green space tech initiative. Talk a little bit about clear carbon and what is that solution for and how is that being applied by Deloitte and, and your clients? Yeah, so it's interesting as I talked a lot about um 
how sustainability is good for business. I talked about the cost side. Sure. The other important part of it is um, there are whole huge, huge opportunities to create new businesses based on carbon as an asset. And that's mm. exactly what Clear Carbon does. It helps companies yeah. create new businesses. And specifically what it's doing is um, helping create carbon insets and carbon offsets, which is a, you know, a producer uh, reduces the carbon intensity of their, their products. And quantifies and tracks that carbon intensity and is able to sell that onto uh, on, onto another customer. So to give you an example, sure. we're working with a client that is uh, producing uh, uh, low carbon, low CO2 proteins, chicken and beef. And the way that they do that is they have to um, push out incentives to all of the ranchers and farmers in their supply chain to change their practices in ways that reduce the amount of methane that are coming from their uh, operations, they need to create those programs, pass the information back, collect information from their supply chain, pass the incentives back so that they can pay those farmers and ranchers to change those practices, collect all of that information, and then create highly verifiable uh, insets, amount of uh, carbon that's reduced in that supply chain that they can then go on and sell to, uh, to another company. And that's going to be, uh, you know, a multi-billion dollar uh, business for them. And if you think across industries, any company that has the ability to reduce the carbon intensi intensity of their products has the ability to make that, uh, uh, stand up that kind of business. And so we're also seeing that with um, uh, chemical companies, with cement manufacturers, with uh, steel manufacturers, all have the ability to think about carbon reduction as an asset that they can uh, you know, use used to create new businesses, and that's what, and Clear Carbon helps them manage all of the complex information gathering uh, through their supply chain that's needed to do that. Ch changing topics a little bit along those same lines, though, where are we in the carbon trading world and offset world? It seems like when I go out to that marketplace and I we have meetings with various firms that are selling carbon credits and. Uh, we're looking to get some of our credits certified. It seems as though it's still the Wild West. Is it the Wild West on top of the first inning still? And that's going to be rationalized in the months and years ahead? Yeah. I mean, as you know, the offset market is necessary. The reason yeah. it's necessary is that uh, most organizations, most companies can't 100% decarbonize from within their company. Right. To give you one example, I'm working with a large hospital system. They have anesthetic gases that are about uh, about five percent of their footprint. There's yeah. no way right now to decarbonize those. Those are just uh, and and you know they're high, highly um, uh, uh, warming inducing gases. Um, so they'll need to buy offsets for about five percent of their footprint. Um, that's within the standard set by the science based target initiatives that offsets should should be part of. Um, uh, you know, uh, part of emissions that can't be reduced within the operations of the companies. So there will be the need for that that kind of market. Um, the market is still early, though, and a good offset should have permanent. So it should permanently remove carbon. It should have additionality. So it's carbon that would not have otherwise otherwise been removed except for the purchase of that offset. And the definitions around those factors right now are still frankly a little loose so there's variable quality in that offset market and you're seeing that in the fact that you know the price of an offset uh, for a ton of carbon is anywhere from under ten dollars to over two hundred dollars right now and so that that just shows that there's a huge difference in quality right. um, I think what will happen is um, buyers will either have to be will be are becoming more discriminating about how they think about the quality, the right kind of offset for them, what technology they're using, um, what markets it is, it, it, do they want it in the same locality where they're operating, the co-benefits associated, so kind of what does that project do? And I think that that's already starting to happen in the market. And I think there probably is the need over time for either more voluntary or more regulatory standards um, to get more you know, quality in that market. but. But I, but I think, you know, I do hear from some people now that, um, you know, as you said, it's the Wild West, offsets are poor quality, so we should just avoid them. And I, I, I don't think that's possible. I think they're, they're an important part of how we decarbonize. Well, we, just need, we just need to get to better quality. Understood. Understood. Um, let's go back to clear carbon. So is clear carbon part of that mm, 
trend among OEMs to create at OEMs in OEMs corporate uh, structure, uh, design for sustainability office, and that would fit into the design for sustainability offices for, for a lot of the OEMs across different industries? Um, you mean as, as part of what the sustainability office does? No. So, so yeah, so now I'm at a company. So for instance, I recently interviewed uh, the sustainability uh, leader for uh, Allbirds. And they just created. They're gonna and they're gonna put out next year their uh, first net zero shoe. Right. Yeah. So now they've designed and they've sourced that net zero shoe. So since that shoe is going to have a lot less footprint than uh, um, than previous shoes, uh, both that they've produced, but also their competitors produced. Does Clear Carbon come into that analysis for for their new shoe that they're going to put out into the marketplace? It, it could potentially. So um, when companies are looking at sustainability, um, their their and the business benefits, they're they're largely looking at uh, quality, uh, brand differentiation, differentiation with investors. They're looking at cost takeout, and they're looking at new revenue opportunities. Right. Clear Carbon is on the revenue side. So how do you generate uh, new revenue from new business? And the Allbirds example, you know, is, is a great example where, you know, the way you generate um, additional revenue is you put out, you know, new products that are highly sustainable products that delight your consumers. Um, a lot of times those products are just just better products. So they the food tastes better, the clothes uh, wear better and more durable. There are a lot of those kinds of examples um, or they find ways to, you know, to monetize the carbon in, in, a, in a B2B way. Um, uh, setting and so that's but clear carbon plays on that that new revenue side understood let's talk a little bit about the um you're going in to pitch a new potential client and you're bringing your team in and their and their c-suites there and their leadership team is there what is typically when you're in a meeting and you're laying out all these tremendous like you said savings you know capital savings obviously goodwill building uh, obviously, just the need to keep up with the times and the necessity of of ESG and uh, and uh, sustainability, climate and equity, uh, not only talking, but walking and then also reporting on what are the major challenges or objectives you have? And it, because it seems like a layup of a meeting, but no meeting is ever a layup. What, do you, what right. pushback or objections or challenges you usually find when you're in those initial meetings with some of the greatest leaders of, of some of the best brands around the world? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the big shift, and you're right, it's not a layup, um, but the big shift has been that um, I think we're past why with most uh, C-suites. They they get it, and it's a, part of it is, you know, what I said, that it's personal. Most people get the importance, um, but then most people also get that it's important for their business, right? And they've also, they're hearing about sustainability from their customers, their investors, from their people, so that they 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 know intuitively it's important. We can help put together the, you know, the business case. Uh, and then I think what's, what's hard, like, what is the, you know, the, you know, as you said, the, what do you need to get over in that meeting? It's, it's the how. So how do we actually do this? And, um, you know, if a company has uh, investments in buildings and manufacturing plants, um, how do you make those trade-offs? If they have a fleet of vehicles, What's the right schedule to convert those on? When do they do that? How? What part of their life? And a lot of the those um, real nuts and bolts decisions, um, uh, you know, influence the the feasibility and the economics and the and and the time frame to decarbonization. And a lot of the kind of the difficult conversations are about how do you make those trade offs? How do you do that planning? What actions do you take when? Uh, and how do you finance it? And setting a path forward where it's not just next month or next year, it's a long-term plan forward, I assume. Yeah, it's often over 30 years. And so wow. that's, you know, and so that's one of the, you know, one of the, and it's often over 30 years. And for a big company, it's often, you know, billions of dollars in, ca in capital expense. And so, you know, that's capital expense, by the way, that that has positive IRR. So usually, usually has savings or, you know, has um, uh, returns for the company, but it's, it's still a big investment. And so a lot of what we can do is help, um, do the detailed planning, do the sequencing, do the implementation oper operationalization. And then as I said with Greenlight, use the technology to, to, to continually revisit and optimize those, those uh, economics as the technologies change. As the trusted advisor 
and an integrated solution provider in services with regards to sustainability, climate, and equity. I assume, and because of the density of your client base around the world, that when you come into a situation and you're trying to meet a company or organization of where they are at at that given point, sometimes they're dealing with legacy issues that they've inherited and things of that such. And it seemingly looks like to the management team, there's no way out. But as part of your specialty become creating public-private partnerships, that cross lines and, and create cross opportunities that they wouldn't have seen naturally themselves, but because you have relationships with both local, state, and, and national and international government structures, you're able to come and give them more solutions than they would have ever imagined? Yeah, that's that's true. And I, I, an example in public-private, um, you know, I mentioned IRA, but IRA is one of only, uh, yeah. you know, 15,000 uh, sustainability related uh, tax or incentives programs across the world. And so we have um, a product that we integrate um, in, into green, uh, uh, green light and green space called Incentives Hub that, that tracks all of those incentives programs. Wow. We can pull those into the into the economics and really help companies think about, well, when I'm doing this, um, uh, this factory upgrade, um, where, where should I do it first? What locality? What are the benefits that, you know, the incentives that can pay for it? And so that's really important. The, the other part of it is that a lot of the ma these big problems um, cannot be solved within a single company, even the, the biggest companies in the world. They need to work with their, their suppliers and their customers. And so, for example, we, were, we worked at the cement manufacturer to um, help them um, Put into the market a, a, a very reduced carbon cement. Carbon uh, cement, as you know, is, uh, if I'm correct, about 15% of, uh, of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a big emitter. Wow. And uh, the issue with it is a lot of the benefit producing that cement is is uh, is more expensive, but it's more durable. It fixes carbon during the construction process. But those benefits are not uh, felt by the the cement manufacturer. They're felt by the construction company. So we had to help them put together a program to do partnerships with their with their customers the large construction companies so that they could share those benefits and that that made the economics of the the product work out and you see those kinds of situations um, um many examples across all kinds of different industries and part of the advantage of our scale is we're, we're a lot of times able to Bring, bring those kinds of relationships together. And if I'm a real estate developer, going back to your example, if I'm a real estate developer and building the next great skyscraper in Miami, Chicago, or New York, and I'm able to use this green cement and you're able to track all the benefits that I have. I'm, you, get, you get higher rental rates, right? And there, there's just a study I read that in the London market, um, you know, green buildings are, are renting for 20% 20 more, right? And so so it's how, how do you capture that value and share it so that we can get, you know, unlock some of these uh, the, these these opportunities. As the road to higher rates is you also help me get a huge leg up five steps ahead in terms of earning my green, my platinum lead certified uh, you know, status of that that new building I'm building. Right. Right. Oh, Absolutely. Well, you know, you've seen a lot of stuff and, and we've 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 both been um, subject to the fits and starts of, of sustainability and and these trends, but they do seem now unstoppable and undeniable uh, in sustainability, climate, and equity. At least, you know what are you most excited about, John? In in the in the in the months and years ahead, with with regards to sustainability, climate, and equity, and your practice, and the fact that we really do need to make uh, the world get decarbonized fast. As you know, we're living in 2023 in the hottest year ever in the world's history. So it is. Yep. It, the, Forget the science for a second. The facts are the facts, and yeah. the facts are this is real. Uh, what do you what 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 gets you most excited right now? Given that you have a lot of visibility to a lot, what's going on? Yeah, I'm you know I'm an optimist overall. I mean, what you said is absolutely true. The science is that we're not you know we're not moving fast enough. Um, what makes me optimistic though is the um, these massive changes in the economics of sustainability and the technology around sustainability that we talked about, um, the fact you know that that most of the changes large companies make are make economic sense. They pencil out just on the economics. And if you had asked me five years ago, I never would have believed that that would be true. And so it's just so much change has happened so quickly, uh, and that makes me optimistic that um, that you know we're we're going to get this right. Um, and 
um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm excited about, uh, you know, the, the next decade to be doing what I'm doing right now to really, you know, decisive time for, you know, for, for my firm, my career and, you know, the world. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm, you know, generally an optimist. Well, that's awesome. And I want to thank you again, John, for joining us today on the Impact Podcast. To find John and all of his colleagues and the important and great work they're doing at Deloitte in sustainability, climate, and equity, please go to www.deloitte.com. Uh, like I said earlier, you go to the services bar, you drop down to the sustainability, climate, and equity section, and there you have it. It's all right there. John, thank you for making the world get on this path and journey to uh, decarbonization and making it a more equitable and a better place to live. I thank you and everybody at Deloitte, and you're always welcome back on the Impact Podcast. Thanks very much, John. I appreciate it. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. <laughs>